So this evening, our speaker is Michael Arnzen, who holds several Bram Stoker Awards for his disturbing and often funny fiction, poetry, and literary experiments. He's been teaching as a professor of English in the MFA program in writing popular fiction at Seton Hill University since 1999. Um, he's going to be talking tonight about the transformation scene. And rather than describing what he's going to talk about, Michael, I just want to turn it over to you and let you talk. Wow. <laughs> Well, thanks, Rose and everybody. I, I can't believe uh, how big this group is. It looks like there's about 60 people signed in. So that's awesome. Thanks for having me. Uh, my connection, I think, with this group is David Corwell, who uh, actually was a student and graduated from uh, the MFA program where I teach. So if he's out there or if you see him, tell him I said hello. <laughs> uh, I have a PowerPoint I could use, but I'm not sure if this Zoom session is set up for me to do that. Um, um, do we have I've him as a you, host? I, I have you as a co-host, so if no. you want to bring up whatever your PowerPoint is, you should be awesome. able to share a screen. Okay. Well, I, uh, before I do that, uh, let me just say that I'm, I'm not just going to read slides off a of PowerPoint. I want this to be interactive. So if you have comments or uh, questions, feel free to put them in the chat room. Sometimes when you do this stuff over Zoom, you can't see behind the PowerPoint. So uh, I'll try to dip in and out of it if I if I uh, can. Let me see if I can share my screen with you guys, and then we'll just jump right in. Hmm, okay, can you see that? Yep. All right. Um, I see faces, but not the chat. So, uh, you know, maybe you can just uh, interrupt me or raise a hand or something like that if you have a question as we go. And I'll probably, like, call out to you guys with questions because I am a college teacher. <laughs> That's what I do. <laughs> yeah, Michael, if I get if I get questions in the chat, this is Brenda, I'll go ahead and interrupt and, and do you want them as perfect. you're doing it or at the end of the presentation? As I'm doing it, it's perfectly okay. fine. But if anyone wants to wait, that's fine too. I, I don't know. We got about an hour, right? Yeah. So let's, yeah. yeah, let's just talk about this stuff. Uh uh hmm. Writing the transformation scene. Let me zip this up a little bit. Maybe, well, I guess I can go full screen. Let me see how that works. Okay, cool. So here we are, uh, writing the transformation scene. Uh, mostly I would like us to think about um, ways in which characters change and evolve in our stories. And so everything that I've planned to talk about is kind of theoretical and abstract. And it's up to you to think about how this might apply to your own work in progress or stories you've read that you've enjoyed that you want to emulate or whatever it might be. Uh, I'm sure right from the title, some things come to mind when I mention transformation scenes. Uh, there are some iconic ones. Uh, and we'll look at a couple of those in a minute. But uh, just to introduce myself a little bit, my name is Michael Arnzen. Not only do I teach at Seton Hill University, I have a couple of how-to books that you guys might be interested in. One is called Many Genres, One Craft. Uh, it's an anthology of how-to articles written by genre writers. So uh, that's an interesting one that you might want to look for. It's really thick and meaty. Uh, and, and then I have a, a collection on Amazon you can download uh, called Instigation, and those are all strange, crazy prompts. So if you want to write some weird fiction, some horror stories, I don't know, publish in the horror zine or whatever it is, <laughs> uh, you might want to look at Instigation. Um, anyway, on the left side of this, you can see some of the books I've published. Short stories, novels, novellas, I'm into it all as long as it's crazy and dark. <laughs> but uh, I don't want to just talk about horror today. I'd like you to just think about transformation. So uh, when I ask, what is transformation? What is your initial answer? Does anyone want to share what, immediately what they think of when I ask that question? Okay. Shape shifting? Shape shifting. Good answer. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the word shift is the key there, I think. Uh, it's the transformation is change, right? So uh, I looked it up. <laughs> the dictionary definition, there's many, but let's say the Oxford English Dictionary defines it as a thorough or dramatic change in form or appearance. 
And to me, that's obvious, but uh, there's a key word in there, dramatic. Uh, if you think about what we do, we dramatize things as storytellers. So really, this is a big thing in fiction writing. And think, look at all the synonyms for transformation that there are. Not just change, but alteration, uh, modification, right? Uh, total conversion, or as you just said, Sue, shift, shape-shifting. Uh, metamorphosis, which is the name of Kafka's story of change. Uh, and I, I don't need to read the whole list, but evolution, mutation, those are big words. And all of these terms uh, actually are processes that you might find at, in action in your stories on, on one level or another. It doesn't just have to be about, uh, you know, somebody turning into a werewolf or something like that, though that's a pretty iconic shapeshifter and something that we can talk about. Uh, and in fact, mo most people do associate this concept with uh, certain genres of, of fiction, particularly in the horror genre, because change can be scary. <laughs> if you're taking notes, that's the that's the first note, right? Change can be scary. So, like, there are stories of shapeshifters, uh, cursed characters that are transformed, maybe possessed characters like uh, Reagan in The Exorcist or something like that. Uh, scary stories where people turn into monsters and creatures. <laughs> and we either see that depicted or we just see uh, people afraid of that happening to themselves. It's like flip sides of the same coin uh, in, in fiction. But, you know, if you think about it, there are just general uh, fiction often depicts transformation like in a coming of age story. Uh, it's just moving from one sort of role or point in your life to another. And so if you write YA fiction, you're probably writing tales of transformation from some, some sort of like lower age category to a higher age category. Not necessarily, you know, youth to adult, but that's mo most often what it is, the movement into adulthood. Uh, coming of age uh, writers, YA writers, they're usually depicting a character who's kind of navigating the world and trying to, you know, really learning how to do it on their own without the help of adults or whatever. And through that process and struggle, they, they change. Um, all right. And there are some iconic stories that you might want to keep in mind as we talk about this. I already mentioned Kafka's Metamorphosis, if you're familiar with that. But to me, the iconic one isn't necessarily a werewolf story. It's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. To me, that is like the sui generis of transformation. Uh, in the horror genre, that's a biggie. <laughs> and it really sets the template for all these other ones like American Werewolf in London, The Fly. I love the Cronenberg version of that. I, I hope you guys have seen that. If you haven't, watch it for Halloween, please. Or do a double feature with The Thing, which is amazing as well. All right. I, uh, can you think of other stories that are pretty popular that people might uh, think of when they think of tales of transformation? Anything pop into your head that's not on that list? The Mummy. The Mummy. <laughs> yeah, especially yeah. The, the, the one with Peter Cushing. Oh, the classic. All right. Sure, sure, sure. You know, any tale of like the undead, you could say, is about this as well. The living dead, right? It's, it's like they've changed from normative humanity to something else. <laughs> I love this stuff. I, I don't know about you, but uh, I, I, to me, transformation is uh, just a, a, a real core element of the horror genre, which is the one I work in. Um, but I think it's bigger than that. And they also had that that series practically where they had a whole bunch of people undergoing weird transformations in agents of shield the series oh i, I didn't you watch know, that and they would the, this funky crystal would hit and if they had the right gene then they became something else now if i'm remembering i, I mean i haven't seen that but that's like almost like the marvel universe they turn into superheroes or something like that they have superpowers some of them turned into monsters and some of them turned into superheroes depending upon other factors in their anatomy <laughs> okay <laughs> Uh, yeah, sure. So, some, someone in the chat mentioned the absolute classic of Frankenstein. Oh, wow. Yeah, sure. 
Sure. And, you know, if you think about that story, it isn't just that like a body is re uh, resurrected and all that, but Victor himself kind of is changed <laughs> by what he's created. He's horrified by it. Uh, and, you know, essentially he wants to, you know, undo what he's done, but it's too late. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, his attitude towards uh, the, the, the dark arts <laughs> uh, and science has changed in the process. Yeah, and Dolly right. mentioned the Hulk. The Hulk! <laughs> I love that. Yeah, you don't want to make him mad, that's for sure. Uh, but, you know, all right, so you guys have uh, iconic stories in mind, whether, whether it's the Hulk or Frankenstein or Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And uh, if you think about it, you know, what is the cool part about those stories? What is it that attracts people to stories of transformation? Uh, and I would start by saying that people love to see it happening. This is why it's uh, it's very popular in film. Uh, you know, if there's a werewolf movie, the director will spend a lot of time showing the changes happening to the body, and it becomes a spectacle, a spectacle. Uh, and same thing with in the fiction in fiction writing, the author will spend time detailing the transformation, like explaining how the body changes the alterations to normalcy or whatever it is, the mutation, because there's a certain thrill to that. And uh, a lot of people read these genres to, to in, you know, anticipating that, waiting for it to happen. It becomes a very important, pivotal part of the story. But um, as you can see on the slide I'm broadcasting now, there's a degree to which all stories are about transformation. And I don't know if you, you know, follow Joseph Campbell's theories of the hero's journey or not, but, you know, this is a pretty uh, dominant way of thinking about, you know, what characters go through in a story. They move from, uh, from, from a familiar world to an unfamiliar world, and they have all these encounters and challenges and battles. And then ultimately, in the climax of the story, usually they're changed because they've they've learned something new, uh, and it's as if they're reborn. And and Campbell suggests that all stories are kind of about this, that they're a template for us to kind of process and think about changes because we all change during our lives. And you know, art imitates life. We read stories, we tell stories because they're like little parables of change. Um, so this is important stuff. Uh, and again, I'm just asking you to think about this and how it might relate to your own stories. I'm not gonna necessarily give you plot points, uh, but uh, if we think about plotting, you know, there's a degree to which uh, in fiction, if you don't have a character undergoing change, you haven't written a story yet. Uh, that's one of the defining um, elements of fiction is change. Uh, you know, so when you write a story, but be it a novel or a short story, when you get to the end of that story, maybe the first draft, you're thinking about what to do to revise it, clean it up, get it ready to send to a publisher. Just check yourself real quick and say, how is how is my protagonist? been changed by the events that I have dramatized here. Uh, there's a textbook, I use it in my fiction writing classes by Janet Burroway. Maybe some of you have read this. It's just called Writing Fiction. I recommend it to everybody because it's really clear explanation about what makes for good fiction and what readers respond to in our stories. And she has this formula for drama where she says, drama equals desire plus danger. Uh, that is, characters want things, they need things. You probably have heard of this called GMC, Goals, Motivation, and Conflict. It's kind of a catchphrase that a lot of fiction writers learn about. There's a book by that title you can read. Um, and that's what our stories do. We depict people who want things but can't always get them. There's some obstacle in the way or there's some threat to what they want. When characters battle the demons or, you know, uh, try to solve the mystery, and, you know, whatever it might be in our plots, they are changed by the confrontations that they have along the way. Um, sometimes they don't realize that they're changed. And, you know, maybe a lover in the story tells them that or a partner. Uh, but I, I think it's important just to remember that. 
And the reason is because if you go back to the definition of transformation, it's about a dramatic change. So you have to ask yourself, what is drama? Um, now, I don't want to get into this kind of stuff. Maybe you guys have read Save the Cat. Have you heard of that? It's a pretty popular uh, book about plotting techniques. Uh, it, Blake Snyder is the author of that book series. And uh, Save the Cat is kind of talked about a lot, uh, but mostly in regards to screenwriting. Um, and he has this like formula for writing screens or screenplays. Uh, and in it, in that book that he has, Save the Cat Strikes Back, uh, he talks about plots. His phrase for that is plots are a transformation machine. And I just wanted to give credit to that because, you know, that's my topic today is transformation. And this is just further proof that all stories are really about dramatic changes. Uh, his point is that you should structure your, your fiction or your screenplays anyway, uh, in a way that it, first we see a character as they are, uh, the status quo as it is. He calls that the thesis. I think he's borrowing from Aristotle or something here. And then there's a kind of like a um, an alternative world that that character is plunged into, or they are forced to be the opposite of the way they normally are. Um, uh, a lot of survival stories might have that. Uh, I think a good template for this might be the Wizard of Oz. Dorothy is, you know, on the farm with her uncles and so forth. Uh, then the tornado comes and she's in Oz. That's and Oz is the antithesis of her home. It's the exact opposite. It's this crazy world just to, you know, follow the yellow brick road and all that. But the ending of a story, an ending of an, you know, the third act of a play for Blake Snyder is where a character has kind of come to terms with that, um, that an antithetical world, that topsy-turvy, upside-down world, and has figured out how to kind of match what, who they are with who they, they need to be to survive in that new world and have synthesized and become a whole person in the process. Whatever. Uh, I just wanted to, you know, acknowledge that and turn you on to that book if you're interested in learning that in depth and looking at all those plot points or whatever. Blake Snyder's Save the Cat Strikes Back. But I think a lot of writers get fooled into thinking that there's only one way to outline a story and they want these formulas that have plot points, whether it's Save the Cat or, uh, you know, uh, Fry Tog's Pyramid or whatever it might be. Uh, I think too often we focus on, and this is all important, but it shouldn't be your sole focus, uh, is my point. That plot is not just about actions. Uh, too often we mostly just focus on what characters do. We're plotting out what happens next, which is crucial, especially in like mystery of suspense. We're thinking about who does what to who, which is uh, very important, uh, you know, especially in romance. We're focused, we detail where a character is, we brainstorm how a character acts, we, we think about, well, what will, when will a character actually make a new discovery, learning, like a, developing a plot point into discovering a clue or something like that. And that's what plotting is, but you can't forget that all of that is about change. And so plot is not just action. Uh, any significant plot point you have is an action that creates some, uh, a consequence. All actions are, you know, stimuli, so to speak, that create responses that you need to think about and, and detail. Significant actions are moments of change which must be dramatized. Uh, so questions you should be asking on top of the whole plotting points and so forth, the outline and structure is, how will those actions transform a character? How does every single plot point you've outlined create change? What's the ripple effect of what you've dramatized? Uh, how much are they gonna change? How radical is it? Is it gonna change them at their core? Are they just, or is it a superficial change? That can be uh, important too, depending on what you're doing. Uh, how often will they now act differently since they changed? You know, is it, are they going to uh, totally dress differently? Are they going to totally uh, respond to problems in a different manner? 
how are they going to act differently and how often? Um, and something else sometimes we neglect is how does a, the, the change in one character impact or even change the characters around them? Uh, particularly important with partners, lovers, uh, you know, teams. If one person's role shifts just a little bit, it can set everything uh, out of balance. Um, and so you have to think about that too. Uh, that even though the main character changes, so too do the minor characters, even though they're not as dynamic and three-dimensional, usually. Are you with me, guys? I feel like I'm lecturing a little bit much, but that's what PowerPoint tends to do. Uh, let's just keep going. I just wanted to remind you, transformation, though, is really about dramatic change, uh, significant, dramatic, sometimes drastic. Uh, when you think of transformation, it isn't just that it's a, you change your mind or something like that. It's like you have been changed for life. Uh, it, it, and it, that's what makes it scary often is that there's no going back after you've been transformed. And I have another slide later that basically says, you sh as a writer, if you want to be good at this stuff, you should take stock of your own life. You should keep a journal or just reflect uh, on moments where you, as a human being, have transformed. When have you made a radical change? It could be something is changing, uh, you know, something as big as changing your appearance. Like, I don't know, if you've always had a beard, suddenly shaving it off or shaving your head or something like that. Uh, it could be a minor thing, like uh, putting on a new style of glasses or changing your name from a long form to a short form or something like that, a nickname. But these things uh, happen in our lives and you'll be better, you know, they say write what you know. So think about what, what do you know about the way that you've changed? How have you grown in that process? How have you maybe alienated other people or, or uh, made new friends because of those changes you've made in your personal life? And just knowing that, thinking about it, can help you when you're depicting your characters going through changes. Sometimes our characters are just little fragments and, and echoes of our own life transformed, usually metaphorically. But uh, taking stock of your own life, especially the dramatic changes you've gone through, which most people associate with like a birth or a divorce or death in the family or something like that. It's not, it, it, usually we think of death and <laughs> new life like renewal, rebirth, uh, when we think of transformation. Michael, and that's because we like to read this stuff, too. Like That's what we really want when we read. Does somebody have something to say? I've got a question in the chat. Um, someone wants to know, can these same types of transformations occur in short stories versus novels? Yes. <laughs> um, I wasn't sure if you guys wanted me to read one to you or not. I mean, I have a piece of flash fiction of my own work. I thought, oh, I could share that and they might see see some things. But uh, I would just say that like in short stories, you don't have a lot of time, right? You got to be brief. It's usually about one event, you know what I mean? Uh, or a build up to a significant event, uh, a turn, turning point. Often though, uh, you know, uh, like I believe the metamorphosis is is relatively short too, uh, but you know it can start with the change, right? Like the beginning of the metamorphosis Kafka story, the first line is you know uh, Samsa woke up uh, as a cockroach. I can't. I wish I could remember the direct quote. I should as a horror writer, but <laughs> uh, but you know you start with it and then. You just dramatize the consequences, or you write a whole sequence of events that build up to one radical change, and that's the ending. Like that's the twist ending or the shocker at the end. So of course you can do a short story that that has a change, but it's like a one step. You know what I mean? Uh, whereas a novel length work might progressively build up changes up until a climax. So I I don't know. I hope that answers the question. Kind of like like the stories of somebody waking up dead, you know, um, <laughs> literally, you know, or they die in it, and and of course the story like the movie Ghost. Oh yeah, you know, nice. So yeah, it's like they start with the change, and then it's.
dramatizing the consequences, the after effects, you know, uh, how one change causes a ripple effect. Uh, uh, how does it echo? How does it, it transform others? Uh, now, changes don't always have to be about characters, but those are the ones we're most interested in as readers, I think. Uh, but, you know, like a change in the environment, like let's say, uh, oh gosh, I, I'm drawing blanks on examples, but you know, I can come up with things like, let's say California fell off into the ocean <laughs> during an earthquake or something, then suddenly you guys in, in Arizona are the new California, right? <laughs> I mean, that's that's a fantasy, but uh, <laughs> uh, how would you describe that? What, what would the change really be like? That's the kind of stuff that uh, we would dramatize, but it would always come back to a character and how they are processing the difficulties and challenges of the new world that they find themselves immersed in. Uh, you probably heard this story, uh, uh, the uh, framework for a story, or uh, it's kind of a, kind of, um, a formula, but uh, the fish out of water story. Uh, sometimes that's what you're showing is what it's like in the new world being out of the familiar world that you were in, like a fish out of water. All right, I've got uh, more to say on this stuff, so let's keep going. Uh, what makes changes dramatic? Well, uh, there are all sorts of adjectives I can come up with. Uh, a dramatic change is surprising. In other words, something shifts in an unexpected direction. I, I think that's key to uh, especially horror stories, but any any form of uh, writing that has like a twist ending or something like that. Uh, a dramatic change is radical. In other words, it's 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 very strong. Uh, when you're when you're writing about change, you're almost rewriting the rules of the game, and then the reader is like, "Wow, what 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 is this game like now?" You know. Uh, Dramatic change goes over the top, it's excessive, it's beyond the norm. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, think about like, I don't know, a, a character turning into a werewolf, uh, how the scene that shows that in a movie might have several shots of like uh, the hair sh suddenly appearing on their knuckles, then the hair on their face growing out, and it just, it just might spend like ten minutes showing <laughs> all this, all these changes happening. It's like when will it end? And that kind of over the top flooding of sensory description in fiction uh, or number of shots in movies, uh, it feels like whoa, things are changing fast, and that's what change feels like. It's like whoa. Uh, you know, hold on, this is happening too fast, it, you know, and that feeling of helplessness that's caught up with that uh, is important to dramatize. Uh, it's also destabilizing. So some kind of structure, whether it's the human form or, like I said, you know, the uh, uh, tectonic plates under uh, Arizona, <laughs> uh, that these things are destabilized and lead to changes, again, that are scary. Um, so threats, uh, pain, uh, you can lose your life. These are the kind of things that we often focus on when we're depicting a very dramatic change, a transformation. Uh, you know, you kind of have to die to be reborn, I guess, is the concept there. And uh, I don't want to get into theology. I just wanted to bring that up. <laughs> uh, so transformation is a dramatic change. And therefore, the way you dramatize it has to be surprising, excessive, radical. You got to really shake things up when you're showing it happen. And a lot of this can also happen in memoir when people are going through extreme changes. You know, the death of I family, love that therapy, point. Yeah. Cancer. Um, yeah. Exactly. And I mean, think about like. It's one thing to want to tell your life story. Like a lot of us have that impulse to get it off of our chest or, you know, share our crazy experiences or whatever it might be, or kind of just write through and process uh, something radical like a death in the family or something like that. But think about the reader's needs in that too. Why do we read memoirs about strangers? And, and part of it is to see how other people process change, how they transform, how their lives are altered. And what do they do about it? You know, what are the consequences of it? And how do they change their lives to accommodate these unexpected, threatening, challenging, destabilizing 
elements of their life or experiences of their lives. So, uh, very good, thank you. Uh, fear is abstract, but change is measurable. And so, you know, in general, writing gives us a way to uh, concretize uh, or to show things that are very abstract, emotional. You know, we know we fear changes all the time in life, um, but a story kind of lets us see it happening and, and makes it feel real. Uh, and it, you know, horror writers particularly, or spec fic writers who are working in speculative fiction, they can show in a measurable way the, how far things change. Whenever you're depicting transformation, you should think about what is lost as well as what is gained. So like if you have somebody turning into a superhero who suddenly can turn invisible whenever they snap their fingers or something like that, uh, think of your favorite superhero power. Uh, <laughs> we always think about what they're gaining, what makes them uh, powerful, what additional, what value add do they have from their superpower. But we often forget that they're also losing something too, right? So like, you know, Batman has to hide in the cave and he doesn't even really have any supernatural powers, but uh, Superman has to go to his uh, fortress of solitude. All right, uh, people, he, people can't know his secret identity. He has to hide that as Clark Kent. So he's always losing something, right? He can't participate in the normal world because his body has changed. So in that loss is drama. Uh, in that gain is drama. So if you're only writing about loss, ask yourself, you know, what is gained by it? And that movement from gain to loss or loss to gain is really an important kind of uh, plot arc or character arc um, that your transformation can illustrate. Food for thought. <laughs> but on that point, Sometimes the outsider viewpoints matter too. So if you're writing about a superhero, again, I'm going to use Superman, even though I didn't plan to talk about Superman, but like we don't just get Clark Kent. We have to have Lois Lane too, <laughs> right? Uh, there has to be that outsider who can see the change and kind of validate it. They assess it. They like, if a, if a character is like, have, have I really turned into a rabbit? Could that possibly be true? <laughs> Some other character has to say, yes, I just saw you hop, <laughs> you know? So it, it, it's validation. Like there's a third party that confirms the reality of the change. This is especially important if you're writing very psychologically, you know, like first person perspective stories of change and transformation. Uh, think about the outsider characters who just witnessed that change. How do they react to it? Are they uh, totally horrified and shocked? Like, oh my God, you've turned into a human fly. <laughs> uh, or are they empathetic and like, oh, you need help. Let me help you, you know, that kind of thing. So, but don't forget that although your viewpoint character, your main character, your protagonist is, is central, uh, those outside characters, those secondary characters matter a lot in regards to measuring the, the degree of change, how radical it is, how frightening it might be, whatever it is. You need that kind of outside perspective, I think. It helps. Uh, so, like, I keep mentioning werewolves. There's, I, I, this is a, you can watch this clip on YouTube. I'm not going to waste your time showing a movie clip, uh, but I just wanted to refresh your memory. If you've seen uh, the movie American Werewolf in London, this is an iconic, this is like one of the best werewolf transformation scenes ever depicted in film uh, because it is so excessive and, you know, he, the, the, they show his whole body changing, right? It, it, it's almost like he's naked on the floor and they show like the hair on his butt, you know what I mean? It's like it goes over the top and it's very different than the Lon Chaney Wolfman kind of transformation that you might be familiar with from the old black and white movies of the, what, 1940s, 30s? What's that? But somebody said something, but, uh, you know, the, in those olden films, like, there would be like a dissolve or something where the, 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 uh, the hair would kind of 
not just grow out of the skin, you know, the hair of the werewolf as the man turned into a wolf man, but, you know, it was kind of phony looking the way that the uh, overlapping images would work so that the, 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 the uh, hair would kind of fade in or something like that. And in modern uh, kind of filmmaking, they depict it very graphically so that literally hair follicles shoot up <laughs> hair and, and and you know there's an extreme close-up on the flesh as that happens and that's just an example of like the excess of, of these moments that i was talking about before um if you're going to show a character undergoing undergoing change this is a good template for it i think this kind of scene <laughs> from american werewolf in london even if you're not writing about vampires think about like how painful that is how uh excessive that look just look at his hand and how elongated that is. It literally looks like a wolf. So, um, and, and it gets, you know, progressively more and more wolf-like. And here the special effects steal the show, but if you were to uh, write this out using prose, uh, you would do all sorts of things that are similar to what the film, the choices that the filmmaker uses in order to depict it. Um, so, um, and I have a short story I told you I could read you if you wanted, but um, if you're going to depict transformation, I think these are the key points to really keep in mind. Uh, how willing or unwilling is your character to really go through this process? Uh, you know, the image of the werewolf uh, that I just showed, uh, that looked pretty painful. He screams during the whole procedure you know as he's undergoing this and it's not a wolf howl it's just ah, agony uh so he's unwilling you know and it comes as a surprise to him actually when it, when that happens in the movie um you know some characters want to change you know they invite it they might have an occult ritual or something like that to try to turn into a you know a new kind of creature or whatever the shapeshifter story might be uh, so there could be pleasure involved instead of pain. Uh, sometimes the transformation is one of static kind of non-movement to uh, dyn dynamism, movement, change. Um, so, for example, uh, I don't know, growing eyes in the back of your head. You know, right now you have this flat part of your skull. It can't move. You can't see through it. But if you were, you know, imagine somebody literally having eyes in the back of their head. If that were something you were to depict in your story, you'd probably emphasize the ability to suddenly move and see things back there. Uh, and the key would be to show the shift from static kind of rock hard skull, skull tissue to liquid wet eyeballs jittering around in new sockets. <laughs> uh, and the writer would have to uh, or often will show a character losing control of one thing while gaining a new ability. I was talking about that with superpowers before. Um, sometimes transformation is about identity. And, you know, part of that might have been what you were thinking about with the example of the memoir. Um, but earlier I mentioned the coming of age story and young adult writers. Sometimes that's what's being detect, uh, depicted uh, is a loss of identity. And sometimes that's felt as a painful thing. Like we don't want to change. It's part of our kind of human nature to almost be conservative and hold back on and, and, and fear change. It's uh, human nature to fear change, um, especially when you got a good. You know, if life is good, you don't want to lose what you got. So change always threatens to to uh, threatens a loss, and that can be a loss of a family member. It can be loss of a power that you have, loss of wealth property, loss of a physical uh, feature, like you lose an arm, maybe you used to be a softball player, a pitcher, you lost your arm, that changes you. So that kind of stuff is is kind of at the root of this and something that you should, should be central to your fiction, the change, the character undergoing these changes. Uh, sometimes the change is simply one that's, you know, something we dread happening or we dream might happen. And then it happens. <laughs> uh, wish fulfillment. 
and its consequences. <laughs> That's the kind of stuff that readers eat with a spoon. You know what I mean? Michael, Does all this sound familiar to you guys? Uh, yeah, we, have, we have several people asking, please read your story. Oh, gosh. <laughs> all right. Uh, I'll read my story. Let's see what I had next. Oh, all right. I'm almost done. So uh, my last slide really was that if you want to get better at this stuff, you should make it a study. You should think about how are characters changing in the story I'm reading right now, whatever it might be, as a reader. When you're watching TV, ask yourself, how is this character changing? How are they different than they were at the beginning of the show by the end of it? That kind of thing. Um, you could say, I'm going to go off and start reading shapeshifter stories and just research that. Uh, that kind of thing, too. But you could also read self-help books. And this might be, <laughs> some of you naturally do that, but others you might be like, what? Uh, a self-help book, uh, a lot of those books on the market are about cha making changes in your life, positive transformations, uh, journeys, whatever it might be, creative visualization techniques and so forth. Self-help books can actually offer interesting templates for you as a writer or for your characters. You can steal those ideas and just apply them to your fiction without ever even really kind of, you know, literally using it or quoting it. You just show it. You show a character doing it. Because <laughs> uh, characters are human. Uh, they often are trying to improve their lives and get foiled. And that's the good stuff. We like to see people endure a, a challenge and then come out as a different, stronger character because of it. Uh, a character loses their eyesight and goes blind. By the end of that story, we want them to be able to use their sense of smell to conquer the world. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, you should also reflect on your own personal transformations. Earlier I was suggesting journal writing is a good way to get good at this. Um, think about how you've changed in your life, what main kind of plot points in your own life story or your life script, as they call it, uh, have been about transformation and change. And really reflect deeply on how you've struggled, how others have seen you, how they have changed because you've changed, that kind of thing, and how you've become a new person by going through these uh, struggles. Uh, and, you know, you can just brainstorm metaphors because I think uh, all this stuff is a metaphor, <laughs> whatever it might be. And also as a writer, you can change too. You can transform your own methods and it might make you a better writer. Uh, I radically changed my own uh, sense of like, my own abilities, I think, once I realized that I, I should stop writing at the dead of night. I used to write in the dead of night, like at, after work, be like, ah, I'm alone now. I can work on my computer. Uh, and I, I, I wasn't getting a lot done because I was exhausted. <laughs> and I just one day said, you know what? I'm going to try to get up early and start writing before my day starts, after I've slept. Maybe I'll, you know, I'll, be, I'll have fresh energy and let me, let me be tired at the end of the work day, not at the beginning. So I, I just started setting an alarm an hour early and using that hour to write, and I got a lot more done. Now I, I swear by that. I just think that's the best time to write, partially because, you know, I'm still in a half dream state, partially because my coffee has just kicked in and I'm ready to go. <laughs> All right. So uh, do you guys want me to read my story? <laughs> do we have enough time? Uh, how long is it? Let me see. Yeah, we've, we've got, a, we got uh, all the time in the world. All right, well, it's two pages long in this book. Uh, it's, it's from the book 100 Jolts. Um, <clears throat> and it's called Domestic Fowl. And I'm not going to say anything about it, except that it's, uh, you know, I'm a horror writer, so it's dark. But a lot of people think this is like an example of comedy rather than horror. So uh, I'll just read it to you and let it speak for itself. I once knew a man who transformed himself into a chicken over the course of two weeks. He plucked his hair, initially in bloody clumps, tearing them fr from his scalp like a cook threshes lettuce, then tweezers for the rest, each and every pore. When I first saw his skin, his head only half bald, his right arm only two-thirds hairless, I asked if he'd ever thought of using a razor. Chickens don't shave, he said, the little nub on his throat somehow giving him trouble. And besides, I have to pluck. He was having difficulty swallowing. I just have to, because, because, block. 
and that was the last time he ever used the English language. I saw him again a week later in the supermarket. He had reached his goal. He was completely without hair. He was without hair and sitting Indian style on the eggs in aisle three of the market. Yellow yolk spotted his naked thighs, which he had somehow pulled up under himself like a fleshy nest. He crossed his arms to hide his hands and puffed out his chest with a hen's pride. But occasionally he would fidget and the styrofoam egg cartons would squeak beneath his butt or the recycled gray cardboard ones would pop like dull bubble wrap. Although his legs might as well have been shaved, he was clearly still male. I caught sight of, the, uh, of his dangling masculinity when he rearranged his legs. I winced at the thought of those tweezers plucking down there, but from the pock marks I'd seen, he'd clearly gone through with it. There were tiny divots of goose flesh everywhere, not just in his groin. But the sight of his crotch brought up a thought, and so I asked him point blank, why a chicken, man? Why not a rooster? Fuck. I guess that was his way of saying, because, just because. To check his sanity, I asked him to hand me a gallon of milk. He obliged. I dared not reach for a carton of large grade A's. He might have been a chicken boy, but he eyeballed me and all the other patrons with the daring stare of the hungry hawk. We were afraid he might peck us. After all, he'd somehow managed to break his face apart and reshape his nose and jaw into a skeletal beak, a real one. The skin was peeled back pink at the base of it in a bloody cuticle. I could only stare at him for so long before finishing up my shopping and heading home. As I stood in the express lane, though, the front doors of the market gasketed right open and a battery of police came running inside. They barred through the register aisles against traffic, and they obviously meant business. I knew they were after my foul friend. I was about to shout a warning for him, actually, but he was already running out the door, flapping his akimbo arms. Several cartons of eggs clutched tightly against his chest. He was saving his children, or at least the ones he hadn't crushed all runny with his legs when he made his roost. The last time I saw him, he actually came to my house. The bell rang, and when I opened the door, he was low on the stoop, pecking around. His transformation was nearly complete. His eyelids were gone. A protrusion appeared under his scalp, where a hen's comb might be. His beak of bone had matured to a full length. His stomach had bloated and his backside had swept impossibly upward into the full rotund shape of the chicken ass. The muscles in his arms had atrophied. The flesh dangled from the bone like an old person's or, more accurately, like a greasy pair of buffalo wings at the local pub. Wings. Sadly, they were incapable of flight, but he had miraculously grown them nevertheless. There were no more hands to speak of. He hobbled around on two taloned feet, communicating with me by gesturing with quick snaps of his head. He pecked the ground if he spotted something grain-like, but mostly he nodded over and over again for me to follow him. I obeyed. It took a while for us to get where we were going because, well, everything looks like food to a chicken. But eventually, he led me to our destination, my backyard, where an axe had been plunged violently into the exposed trunk of a tree stump. He jumped up on the stump and strutted like Mick Jagger. Why, I pleaded, reluctantly yanking the axe free. But this time he just looked at me, his head cocked to one side. Yeah. <laughs> So um, I don't want to uh, analyze my own story too much, but as you can see, some of the points that I brought up earlier uh, about excess, really spending time detailing the transformation are important. Uh, obviously, it's a little over the top and humorous, but it's also fantastical, you know. And um, earlier, I also mentioned that a witness character, you know, an outsider, is important because it helps us assess the amount of change. 
And in this story, it has like three parts. You probably heard me do that. Uh, the changes get worse and worse and worse. And then you start to wonder, is this even a reliable narrator? <laughs> so that's what I was going for with that one. I don't know if you guys had thoughts about it or not. I'm going to actually close the uh, slideshow now.